My name is Dr. Jane Mulderig. I'd like to talk to you today a little bit about some of the research that we do in applied linguistics here at Sheffield University. So what is linguistics? Linguistics is the scientific study of language. Applied linguistics takes that linguistic theory and uses it to investigate real-life language-related problems. Problems like, how do we learn language? How do we best teach it? How do we explore and understand communication problems? How do we use language to build social relationships and indeed communities? In other words, applied linguistics is the use of linguistic science in social contexts. Linguistic knowledge is not quite like other kinds of knowledge. It's not like learned knowledge, for example, how we learn maths or how we learn to drive. Instead, it's uniquely human and it's innate. So it develops in tandem with our biological growth. It's largely unconscious. None of this knowledge appears to be taught. This insight about linguistic knowledge actually goes back many centuries as far as Socrates and Plato, but Charles Darwin captures this in particular in his book, The Descent of Man. He says, language differs widely from all ordinary arts, for man has an instinctive tendency to speak, as seen in the babble of young children, while no child has an instinctive tendency to bake, brew or write. There is in fact empirical evidence to suggest that newborn babies are already familiar with the sound of their mother tongue. So that when they suckle milk, the rhythmic swallowing patterns mirrors the sound patterns of their language. The science of linguistics has developed in order to discover the precise nature and workings of this unique linguistic ability. As young as three years old, native English speakers display quite sophisticated knowledge about their own language. For example, knowing how to add an S in order to make a noun plural. They also know how to realise this verbally. They know how to differentiate between different kinds of nouns. So for example, they know to make this a voiceless S when it's following a, an, a, a noun that ends with a voiceless consonant, like back, cap, or cat. They also know to make it a voiced z sound at the end of voiced consonants, ending bag, cab, and cad. But they're not just copying what they're hearing, because they can do precisely the same thing when they hear words they've never heard before. For example, gluck or glub. Again, they know to use a voiceless sound with a voiceless consonant and a voiced S sound with a voiced consonant. What this shows is they've acquired quite sophisticated phonological knowledge, not only about the voiced voiceless distinction, but also how then to apply that to particular nouns in pluralizing them. And this is when they've not even been taught any of this. So what happens with a second language? This brings about questions like the following. Can learners produce S sounds correctly? Is the distinction between this voiced and voiceless sound also available for second language learners of English? And if it's not, why not? Is it something to do with the nature of their, um, of their first language? What problems do they experience? What variables are relevant in understanding how they acquire language? Does age matter? Does education matter? These are some of the questions that are explored in an important area of applied linguistics called second language acquisition. And it investigates these questions using experimental scientific methods. Just like other science subjects like physics and biology, it follows steps in scientific investigation. So firstly, it makes observations about a particular phenomenon. Secondly, it collects data through carefully controlled experiments. Often this involves using psycholinguistic experimental tools, for example, 
uh, measuring reaction times to a stimulus by pressing a button. Or eye tracking to observe learners' eye movements um, on a visual display. Following this collection of empirical data or evidence, then the researcher can draw principled conclusions from this, deriving reasons or explanations that underlie the data that have been collected. When applied linguistics is brought together with TESOL, teaching English for speakers of other languages, it draws on both linguistic science and educational theory in order to develop theoretical frameworks and pr practical models for language learning and teaching. It explores questions like how can we teach and assess writing? As part of this, should we correct errors? Does it work? What materials can we use in order to suit different types and styles of learners? How can we develop learners' competence in different varieties and genres of English? Should we use the first language in teaching? Is that appropriate? Is it effective? And what is English as a lingua franca? How can we define it? How can we teach it? Should we teach it? Linguistics has interfaces with many different disciplines. And as a result, it creates new areas of study, like psycholinguistics, neurolinguistics, music and language, and sociolinguistics. In fact, linguistics is developing all the time in exploring the relationship between language and the social world. For example, questions like the role of language in shaping new communication technologies. Or in building relationships and communities in an increasingly globalised world. Or in bringing about major social and political change. My own field of research is critical discourse analysis. This examines the relationship between language and power in society. It asks how language constructs racism, sexism and various other forms of discrimination. It asks how certain ideas and assumptions become naturalised and accepted. So, let's have a look at an example of assumptions in UK politics. The UK recently voted to leave the EU. This is known as Brexit. Prior to this, there was a referendum campaign led by politicians. Let's have a look at a campaign slogan. The UK Independence Party's campaign slogan was quite simple. We want our country back. It's quite simple, but it's quite a powerful slogan. And it's powerful because it contains a number of assumptions. Let's see if we can unpack those. Firstly, the modalised statement we want claims shared values with the British public. So it allows the UK Independence Party to imply that everybody wants the same political goals to leave the EU. Secondly, the noun phrase, our country, assumes that a country is something which can be exclusively possessed. It helps construct a nationalistic view of the UK. Thirdly, the little word back is quite powerful. It presupposes that we've lost something. So it presupposes we've lost our country and therefore it triggers our natural emotional response to fear something that we've lost. So it adds an emotional resonance to this campaign slogan. A final implication, of course, is that somebody has taken it. So who? Well, this could imply the European Union, or it could imply immigrants. So it subtly links to a wider 
anti-immigration discourse and links this up with the anti-EU campaign that was run by the UK Independence Party. In fact, this is a typical strategy that's often used in politics. This linguistic strategy allows them, rather than to make rational arguments, instead to assume that everybody agrees with them and shares their values. It's what we might call a hegemonic strategy of claiming shared values and views. This is just one example of the range of different kinds of research that we do um, here at the School of English at the University of Sheffield. This is quite a big school encompassing research in literature, uh, theatre and drama, literary stylistics, and also linguistics and applied linguistics. To facilitate that research, um, we're very pr proud of our new humanities research lab, um, the HUM Lab is a facility for interdisciplinary research um, into the study of language, music and cognition. It offers students the chance to use specialist equipment such as eye tracking and skin conductance equipment to support research projects. In applied linguistics, we're actually quite a small team in a very large school of English, but between us we cover quite a diverse range of research and teaching areas. And this is reflected in our teaching on the MA and Applied Linguistics with TESOL. Here's a list of our most recent research, including my own in critical discourse analysis. Please go to our website uh, where you can find more details of our current research and our most recent publications. Thank you for listening.